patients are dying, people are dying. The current situation in the healthcare system in Zimbabwe has collapsed. Zimbabwe was, for so many years, defined by Robert Mugabe and the struggle for independence. Now he's gone, but this country has yet to emerge from his shadow. Do you trust President Monangagwa to make things better? If there's no jobs, there's no money, there's no foodstuffs. Millions of Zimbabweans go to bed hungry, dependent on handouts for survival. This country is on the brink of catastrophe. Who or what will save it? More than half a million people live in Mbari, a sprawling slum on the outskirts of Harare. This is where Zimbabweans come to escape crushing rural poverty. Many find themselves in a different sort of trap. In the last month, it has been difficult to obtain cash. 27-year-old Richard Fanny is desperate to find a way out. Is it almost impossible to find a, a full-time proper job? It's next to never finding a Next to never. Ne next to never. No jobs and soaring inflation. It's a recipe for wholesale desperation. Aid agencies reckon half of all Zimbabweans now rely on assistance for survival. Do you trust President Monangagwa to make things better? No. So why do you say he's making things worse every day? I don't know if it's him or it's what, because things are getting worse and worse every day. Prices are going for transport, schools, clinics are closed, everything is down. We are struggling. And do you have children? Yeah, and they are not going to school. I can't afford to pay his school fees for them. You, they're not even going to school? Yeah, they are home. When Munungagwa replaced Mugabe, people hoped that maybe things would get better. They were better before. Really? Yeah. You seriously think things were better under President yes. Mugabe? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They yes. Were better before. It's becoming Mugabe is better every day than in Mugabe. Zimbabwe's infrastructure is crumbling. Two million people in Harare have been without piped water for months. The fear is isolated cases of cholera and typhoid could become an epidemic. And the country is in the grip of a power crisis. Drought has cut hydroelectricity supplies. This coal-fired power station on the road to Mbari has run out of spare parts. At sunset, the mood shifts quickly on Ambari streets. The entire neighborhood is plunged into darkness, pierced only by fires, oil lamps, and the lucky few with generators. Richard is now taking me to a friend's house. It's about seven o'clock in the evening, and I can tell you that walking through Mbari in the dark well, it's a pretty weird experience. Richard guides me down dark alleys and into a block originally built for single male laborers, but now teeming with families crammed into tiny spaces. Thank you for letting us come into your home. Yvonne Mugombe and nine members of her family, spanning three generations, live in this one room. Yvonne? In the dark at night, when there's no power, there's no lights, do you and the kids feel safe here? No, we don't feel safe. Because some of the people are being robbed at night. There are thieves all over this community. So we don't feel safe if there's no electricity. When Zimbabwe's military pushed Robert Mugabe out of power two years ago, there was hope of an end to the era of misrule and corruption. Incoming president, Emerson Munangagwa, 
promised economic reform, modernization, and a rise to middle income status by 2030. By early this year, hope had morphed into anger and despair. When the government lifted fuel subsidies, protesters took to the streets. A dozen people were killed in a brutal crackdown. It was as if Mugabe had never gone away. Arguably, things are now worse. Amid a currency crisis, fuel imports have been cut. And those who need petrol face a wearying ordeal. Just tell me how long you waited to get to the head of the queue today. Well, I got in the queue at half seven this morning, and I'm here now, which is... Yeah, well, that's three hours. That's three hours. That is uh, a lot of your work day been taken up with sitting in a car doing nothing. Well, that's my morning gone. It makes business very difficult. It makes the whole of your life very difficult. But it is a way of life here. The later Mugabe years saw the Zimbabwean currency collapse and hyperinflation set in. The US dollar became the de facto currency. Now there's an effort to reintroduce the Zimbabwean dollar, but only in limited amounts to thwart the black marketeers. Just taking a walk through central Harare, and I've just spotted a large crowd of people outside what I think is a bank. So let's go find out what's happening. Show me the, the new Zimbabwe dollars. So it's a new $2 bill. Yes. And they've just printed these for the first time. Yes. And how many dollars were you allowed to take out today? $100. It will last for how many days? If $100? $100. We can use $100 for one day. One day? Yes. And then it's finished? Yes. Are you confident that the government and President Munangagwa are stabilizing the economy? Because it has been a mess for a very long time. Yes, I'm confident. You are? Yes. Because many people here are not. Why, why are you Me, so confident? I'm very, very confident. Why? Because enough is enough. You've suffered enough. Yes, but I'm confident we are, everything is going to be stabilized. It seems like Zimbabweans, they have this ability to survive, even in the most difficult situation. We are strong people. That's why we are called Zimbabweans. We are very strong people. There is a veneer of normality in Harare, but scratch the surface and desperation is exposed. This should be one of Harare's busiest hospitals, but the chronically sick are being sent home. Almost all the doctors are refusing to work. They don't call it a strike. They say they've been incapacitated by salaries that have been dramatically devalued. Masimba Ndoro is 25, a proud and newly qualified doctor. So is Tapiwa Mongofa. After all the hard work, the training, they've both been fired for refusing to work. You're a trained doctor. You should be in the hospital, but you're not. You're not at work. Why? We as doctors are incapacitated to report for duty. That is to say we cannot afford uh, to report for duty each and every day. We can't afford uh, transport. Why? Because the, uh, the money that we are getting from the government is not enough for us to, to, to come to work every day. To be brutal about it, is this all about money? You want more money than the government is prepared to offer you? Absolutely, this is about money. So there is a gap and the salaries that we are getting from the government are completely detached from the reality and from the uh, situation on the ground. In real terms, that is in US dollar terms, your last salary was basically about $4 a day. Yes, basically, uh, if you are to deduct, it's basically around $4 to $5 per day. And is that possible for you and your family to live on? I think if you are to if you are to deduce uh, to use it for transport, uh, food, uh, accommodation, that's something which is paid to paltry salary, and you can't you can't even have a decent living. Many Zimbabweans might say to you, "Look, guys, life is tough for everybody in Zimbabwe, but you have special skills. You are a doctor. You are." Your whole career is about caring for people. How can you, because of money, walk out of your hospital? Okay, I, I, if, if I may appeal to your conscience and to the conscience of the uh, people of Zimbabwe who think like that. Um, I, I have some special skills. 
uh, that I am willing to use. I'm actually willing to be at work, but the situation is that I cannot afford to be at work. How hard is it for you as a doctor to know that there are very sick patients in that building behind you, but you feel you cannot go in and treat them. How hard is that for it's, you? It's, it's very hard and it's very heartbreaking. Uh, as doctors, we actually have our patients at heart. And this, what we are doing, we are actually advocating for the patients. What is, is happening to all the what, sick people what in Zimbabwe? What is happening to the sick people in Zimbabwe is that patients are dying. People are dying uh, and, and, and uh, I mean avoidable deaths uh, because of the current situation in the healthcare system in, in Zimbabwe has collapsed. There is no healthcare system to talk about. But the government would say that is on your conscience because you are the doctors who are refusing to work. Yes, but it's not on our conscience because uh, we cannot uh, uh, afford to come to work and I cannot use my conscience to pay for my bills. I cannot use my conscience to pay for transport. I am just an ordinary employee like any other employee and I need to be capacitated for me to do my job. Do you feel the same? How, how do you cope for yourself with your own conscience given that there are so many sick people who are suffering as a result of this? Yes, I, I, I don't draw any pleasure from this, but I believe uh, this is a silent genocide which is uh, going on. Uh, people are dying because uh, they can't uh, get uh, the health care services they, uh, they deserve to get. Uh, did, it's, did you it's, just said yes, a silent genocide. A silent genocide. That is a very, very strong phrase, yes. a strong idea. Yes. Do you really mean that? You mean the government is right. is let, deliberately let jeopardizing the health explain. of the people? Let me explain. Now, uh, it is the government's responsibility to make sure affordable uh, and quality health care is provided to its citizens. I mustn't be thinking of rentals, food, accommodation, um, basic, basic, basic needs if I'm at attending to a patient. I should be a well-focused, motivated worker when attending to a patient. Would you love to be attended to a, to a demotivated doctor who is thinking of other things whilst he's attending to your healthy needs? I guess no. Since independence, Zimbabwe's parliament has been dominated by ZANU-PF. Mugabe's party, Munangagwa's party, a ruthless political machine. The party blames continued international sanctions for the country's parlous state. Misrule and mismanagement are never acknowledged. And as the president attended parliament for the annual budget presentation, a crowd of loyalists was rounded up to put on a show. So President Mnangagwa has just arrived at the Zimbabwean Parliament as the budget is about to be presented. And Zanu PF have pulled out a lot of supporters to make some noise, but in truth, it's a pretty lackluster affair. After Mugabe, the promise was change. Instead, Zimbabweans are getting more of the same. Minister Mangaliso Ndlovu, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, thank you for having me and welcome to Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Let me begin this interview by quoting some words from President Manangagwa at the time of his inauguration. He said, we are going to grow, modernize and mechanize our economy. We will transform our people into middle income citizens. The reality is very, very different. What's gone wrong? Thank you for that. Um, there are always uh, silent features in certain statements in that he never said it will be easy. He did not at any point underestimate the magnitude of the work that lies ahead. So we are quite confident uh, that the journey we have traveled so far and the journey we still are to travel uh, it, it's, it's quite promising. So yes, but, we have... But most young people simply don't have work. They do not have an income. I went to Mbari yesterday, a vast sprawling suburb on the edge yeah. of this city, Harare. I spoke to dozens of young people. None of them had a job. Employment remains a challenge. And um, I'm, I'm glad just to say that we have even put very specific incentives targeting at employment creation for young people in the coming years. And but you've, you've had two years already. What, what's happened in those two years? Well, 
there has to be uh, reforms in place, which we have done, which we have put in place. Um, I wanted to just get back to the direction that we have taken. We sought in our transitional stabilization program to stabilize the macroeconomic environment and particularly targeting budget deficit and uh, current account deficit. These two, in my view, we have done very well. Uh, it's still work in progress. And once these have been addressed, we believe that we'll have the necessary impetus to then grow the economy and create the jobs that we saw. Stability, we you say, stability. Well, let's look at the perhaps most obvious sign of instability, currency crisis. Your finance minister has just introduced new Zimbabwean dollar bills, $2 and $5. I've seen the vast queues outside banks because people are only allowed to withdraw $100 a week in most banks. There is still a raging black market in currency exchange. There are speculators just a few yards from this hotel ex still exploiting people because your currency crisis is not resolved. I, I will agree with you that we still have a challenge in the currency uh, situation, particularly on the speculative side. What has happened is that over the years, Zimbabwe has had almost the largest penetration in terms of digital currency. And this uh, involved inclusion of quite a number of people. I think we were close to 85% financial inclusion due to our mobile money transfer system. But because of the fragility of our currency, people have tended now to want to use more of the hard currency, hence the pressure which we are seeing in the banks. And this is creating loopholes and opportunities for arbitrage for but, people. But, yeah, but with respect, your government isn't closing those loopholes, those opportunities. In fact, many Zimbabweans believe that people in power are actually collaborating with the money changers and the speculators. Many people in this city and across your country are disillusioned with President Munangagwa and his record. And as we speak, your inflation rate, you won't even publish the figures anymore, but your inflation rate is believed to be somewhere over 300%. You've lost control. Okay, inflation, why we decided that publishing is uh, misleading in a way is because we have transitioned. Last year, this time around, we had a parity in terms of the exchange rate. And when we liberalized our exchange rate, um, it gives a false impression. When you look at our prices last year in US dollar terms, and you compare the prices this time around in US dollar terms, you might find that the prices in US dollar terms have actually gone down. But because of the disparities in exchange rate, then we have these numerous distortions. Minister, Minister I have are you aware that there are many people in your city who are now so impoverished, who see the price rises, cannot afford food, they are reduced them and their families to living on one meal a day. Are you aware of that? I will admit that this has created um, pressure, particularly on the purchasing power. The wages have not aligned to the exchange rate movements, and that has been the major challenge, which we are gradually addressing, but just and a, no doubt. I, I'm asking you as a, as a, as a human being, as a oh, Zimbabwean, yeah. do you go to places like Mbari? I and do you talk to people? To and are you aware that their children are going hungry as we speak? Well, um, there tends to be also issues of um, exaggerating certain issues. We you, are, you, think, you think that's an exaggeration? No, no. I admit that there is a challenge when it comes to food security, which is why we have even put a flash appeal to the United Nations and all cooperating partners. We, uh, when we talk of people going hungry, it, we are literally talking about food on the table. And food on the table, there is a direct impact coming from the drought that we have experienced. And this has stretched, if I may say, uh, government social protection expenditure because we have had to import close to 70% of our grain just to make sure that there is adequate grain in the country. So we have had to focus more on addressing food security issues. I spoke to young doctors yesterday, newly trained, very proud of their qualification as a Zimbabwean doctor. They say they cannot, they will not go to work in the hospitals because they can't afford to. They have, to put it their way, been incapacitated by the fact that the real value of their wages as doctors represents little more than three US dollars a day. Some of them are selling their possessions simply to survive. 
you and your government, again, must bear responsibility for the collapse of your health care system. But what I can say is, from the first day, we have opened our doors for negotiations. We still engage our doctors. This is a process that we don't believe we can resolve within a short space of time. Stephen, I just want to give you a different perspective. Over the last year, we undertook reforms through our austerity measures on our own. I'll give you examples of countries that have gone through reforms and the kind of assistance that they got. We did that on our own. And obviously, we do appreciate that our people have had to pay the price. Look at countries like Greece. They got more than 160 billion support. Egypt, from the spring rise, they got more than 12 billion support. Recently, we heard from the So Zimbabwe uh, but, uh, had to do I this on their own. I understand what you're saying. But, but, but one of the reasons why Zimbabwe is not getting international support is because there's no faith in the competence and the honesty of your government. Just to take a few examples, power plants are lying idle right now, partly because parts which were ordered from South Africa years ago and paid for have never been delivered and no one knows where that money has gone. Look at your national airline. You used to be commerce and trade minister. Surely you are concerned that the national airline isn't allowed to fly because IATA, the international organization, says that it is not satisfied. Your airline has the maintenance safety record which would allow it to mandate it to fly. And these are competence issues. You will realize that um, this is a government that has really struggled over the past two decades. And over time, what you are talking about are real expenditure issues. Corruption issues, I'll put that aside. This is a real challenge, and we are putting efforts to make sure that it is addressed. What you are talking about is something that was unveiled in our internal audit systems, and drastic measures are being taken on that. But on physical expenditure issues, we have had to contend with the effects of uh, isolation, with the effects of sanctions. You rather tactfully put in there a reference to sanctions as though some of this could be blamed upon the international community. For the very limited targeted sanctions which the US and the EU have put on Zimbabwe going back many years, the truth surely is that again scapegoating sanctions will not work because in the words of the US ambassador to this country just the other day, he said, it is unacceptable to talk about sanctions as a scapegoat when Zimbabwe's real problem is a fundamental betrayal of public trust. There are people getting rich, many in Zimbabwe's political elite, as the economy continues to d deteriorate around them. And it is the Zimbabwean people who are suffering. That's from the US ambassador. I wouldn't expect him to say anything different, would you? I mean, it's them imposing the sanctions. If they are so ineffective, what justifies their existence? Because they're targeting individuals who are deemed to be thoroughly corrupt. I am former Minister of Industry and Commerce. The biggest company we ever had in this country was Cisco Steel. It's still under sanctions today. One of the biggest uh, companies that were formed to spearhead industrialization, IDC, was under sanctions. How targeted are these sanctions? When you look at banks that have been penalized just for facilitating transactions, business transactions, you think these are targeted? This is t smart because it's targeted at collapsing the economy. The generation that lived through the Mugabe era saw their hopes crushed long ago. Zimbabwe's tragedy is that a new generation is being robbed of a decent future. Well.